Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays, you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw! Okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. 
back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. S spearmint, Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened, you had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package. Well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paperwork work side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me, but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least, and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Rite. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place. Like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's right was something even more horrific. The droit de seigneur was a feudal right that existed in medieval Europe that gave the lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, 
it wouldn't be surprising. This right could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village, even if they didn't want to get married. It was ridiculous. However, late Middle Age and Renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first knight or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dwight the Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. Kicking off the list at number 10. Wiper, no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go, where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Cause you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, mm -hmm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy had a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers were responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, Dormad toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered and they're destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven. Shards and Sharts. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. I think again. This is a part four and honestly, I can do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my God. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? 
Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all, not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. It's not, they're, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, mm, there you go. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one, you know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458, BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with uh, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so... Again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya, now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news. I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah. Oh, you have acne? Hmm. Are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that. Come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne. Maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this, of course, is a wonderful cosmetic replacement, and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it was clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful, ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails and shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna. Kind of nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you want to get henna. It's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the old spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of deodorant 
deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts, mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there, right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to feta cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. What's up? Kicking off the list at number 10, hot topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. I'll just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on. But today, there's a visine, luckily, for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Everest Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that sh put it in your mouth and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mix in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the f that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription. You're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, 
It works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the great stink. Yeah, the great stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up, leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I want to know who the first guy was to be like, you know what? Nah, I'm going home. This sucks. This sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They had to soak it in chloride to be like, that's better. It's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford. That's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth I apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you have to go back on it so you look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. And I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face, and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick, you ask? Radiation. They didn't know this yet. It was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face. Now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what? At least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? 
Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches. The early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old <laughs> scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching. Those were more hygiene history. I, that was nonsense. Honestly, I feel it, lucky that I'm alive. I'm a bit horrified if I'm being honest, but guess what? This video doesn't end here because we're gonna do some comment shout outs from part one. Taylor, take it away with the first one. Stargard says, just think how around 50 years from now, people are going to look back on this generation and say the same thing about us. Like how horrible it was that women clogged their facial pores and skin by packing makeup into them, thus inviting skin disease. Or how knowing that the mouth has more germs than any other part of the body Body, people still practice tongue kissing on a regular basis. Yeah, or how barbaric those people were back in the early part of the millennium. Yeah, fair. That's <laughs> like the worst part of the mouth and people will go to a club and be yeah. like, nice to meet you. Oh, yeah, like I feel like you had me and then you lost me. And I was like, wait, what? Tongue kissing? I don't That's understand. Fair. Fair. Tamara Labor says, Rachel, you're currently wearing bat feces on your face. Sorry. I knew it. I smelt it. I kind of had an idea. Oh, I knew it. I like it though, I guess. Ew. Marco Becking says, Crystalia's thinner younger brother does this really well. Well done. I hope I'm related to him in a funny way and not his scandal way. Let's keep it at that. Keep yeah, it let's keep it safe, way. please. I've heard that a lot also, thank yeah. you. I'm gonna go shave my head after this. Anyways, guys, that's been our video. Until yeah. next time. I'm Taylor McWaters. And I'm Rachel Fisher. Bye. Bye. Watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, <laughs> OMG wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirm that everything happened. Happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter. 
kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum either in assets or money to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. On number 8, Shotgun Wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then then people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number 7. No objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flesh out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama, discovered after marriage vows were exchanged, caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, Accept it. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why the speak now or forever hold your peace was introduced. At number six, shoes. Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the Aisle. Now this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense because you know, you, you poop and then gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough. Because in 1183, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the Palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guys hadn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet and you're like, really? Really, you thief? Okay, I'm telling. 
Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now, around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels, and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now, come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't, simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black, yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. Yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just ball, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick. Is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible. That's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA your face, that's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Kicking off our list at number 10, ancient Egyptian eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So, in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on you know, how to look good, I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day, in high school, I had to use dippity do Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side, I always got the five out of six hold, that was good. Six was too much, nobody ever did the full six, that's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling spiking glue and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, 
<laughs> what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls, I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the dead sea was one of the most popular popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bathtub, I can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. I swear to God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Is this like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or bran or anything like that. You didn't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head, easy. Back in 2019, experts found archeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resins. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. Nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. This is so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years, the bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like a, basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but 
but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's mealtimes, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a sh I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I, have, no, I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously, today. Horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. Number 10, spinning. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually, because no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti-spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up, perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. 
Ha, though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably. I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, it's so good, you're like, why did you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. So next up, the only way to learn was to learn by trying. That's right, the classic toss them in the deep end and watch them drown approach. Sure, you could get a vague idea as to what intercourse entails from living in towns that had literal brothels or semi-public intercourse, which we'll get to in a little bit, but it was mostly word of mouth or unhelpful packets called marriage manuals. These late 1800 safe sex brochures were laughably inaccurate and stressed the importance of only engaging in the activity during marriage. If you wanted to know anything beyond that, you'd have to learn by doing it yourself. As you've heard, it was pretty chill back then, so when it came down to some PDA and some romping, the whole abstinence pitch was about as useful as their killer contraceptives. There was no proper education on intimacy, which means not only did people not know enough about their parts, but they also had no knowledge of diseases that could come with them. These manuals also highlighted how self-given pleasure was unhealthy because of the use of human, you know, for anything other than procreation was frowned upon in the eyes of the Lord. This lack of education led to the use of their wily contraceptives and also the the use of the next item on our list. Bundling, it's more than just getting cozy. An early custom of the Wild West, a courting couple who wanted to sleep beside one another but had yet to be married but still wanted to withhold from, well, carnal desire, they could bundle. It's exactly how it sounds. The courting people would literally burrito themselves in separate blankets or into a large fabric sack that tied around the neck and would allow them to sleep sinlessly next to each other or even cuddle. Now, I know what you're thinking, Teresa, that little bit of material isn't gonna stop no tomfoolery, especially 
especially once cuddles get into the mix. Rest assured, I got you, because for those who really were tempted, you could also have a bundling board come into play to literally draw the line. It's a physical divider placed down the center of the bed to keep unmarried partners from touching completely. No sleeping sack to sleeping sack action with a 2 by 4 blocking the way. It allowed the two to talk all night and even see each other's faces, sometimes you could cuddle kind of over it, but no intercourse was capable. Both bundling options let couples experience physical intimacy before their wedding, and it was great for when you visited your lady and she still lived at home in a shared bedroom. You see where romping the sack comes from now though? So how about after those I do's? It's out in the open. As forementioned, I would return to the topic of semi-public adult acts, and here we are. What a fun place to be. You know what isn't fun? In the wild west, most families lived in small houses, usually made up of one large room. So naturally, when it came down to it, every member of a family sharing space, privacy wasn't very possible. Yeah, this isn't the fun and flirty voyeur stuff we were talking about. This is more in like grandma's range of vision. In this case, it's fair to question how they would get intimate when <laughs> sleeping in a bed with other relatives. Having more space meant having more money, a type of privacy afforded by class. Money meant privacy, and in the Wild West, there wasn't much money. Meaning shared rooms or houses and finding strategic ways to get off in privacy. Author Brian Watson explained how the American West and North America as a whole went from a mindset of comfort to one of more sheltered as it is now. He cites that during Reformation, figures such as Martin Luther King created a sanctity of privacy surrounding intimacy, something previously non-existent. What's scandalous to us now was more normal to them than how we choose to live. Here's a weird one I didn't expect to learn about in research. Mail order brides. The Wild West had mail order brides. Yeah, not something I would have guessed, but it makes sense. Female populace was next to none, and sure, with more men around than you can choose from, some were fortunate enough to marry good men and live happy ever after. But still, some other women found themselves in desperate situations that robbed them of their youth and sometimes of their lives. So male order actually benefited both the lonely prospectors and cowboys, but also the romance-seeking belle. One way for men living on the frontier to meet women was through subscriptions to heart and hand clubs, newspapers with information and photographs of women with whom they could correspond. Eventually a man might convince a woman to join him in the west, in matrimony, or a woman convinces the man. Social status, political connections, money, companionship, or security were often considered more than love in these arrangements. But some used these to genuinely connect and enjoyed a lengthy correspondence courtship. Some knew each other well and had courted prior to a separation or were connected by their respective families in different cities. We all have that auntie telling us she knows someone she likes for us. Although some matches ended in significant disaster, others yielded lasting contentment and happiness. In brief, Amazing women left hearth and home and traveled great distances to marry a man, and if they were lucky, it'd be one they'd fallen in love with through letters. And last but not least, homosexuality was no scandal at all. In fact, it was widely accepted, normalized, and not even questioned. Y'all think Brokeback Mountain came out of nowhere? Even though Victorians didn't write about it, homosexuality was very, very common then as it is today. But because the Victorians avoided the topic, Hollywood followed suit with depictions of the rugged cowboy and roguish western life that was simplified and manly. This modern erasure of homosexuality, as well as the racial whitewashing of the cowboy image, has long since been disproven by modern research. Archival photographs, memoirs, diaries, and more open attitudes have uncovered the shocking underworld of the West. Wild West society didn't necessarily label people as homosexual or heterosexual, but rather allowed each person to be who they needed to be in any given moment. With women especially not as present in large communities such as a mining camp, some men would fill the role of a woman for physical pleasure and domesticality, and normal gender roles were challenged. This was recorded in Alfred Kinsley's 1948 study, Sexual Behavior in Human Male. This same study reported the highest frequencies of homosexual intimacy to be among men in the rural farming communities, and that cowboys and miners even often coupled up in unions known as a bachelor marriage. Part of this comfortable acceptance comes from the exposure to the neighboring indigenous communities, where we've always acknowledged two-spirit, an indigenous exclusive multi-gender identity, or simply beyond the grasp of sexuality and gender labels. The concept of cross-dressing or same-sex partners partnership is completely normal. It's crazy to think how LGBTA people of the Wild West may be quite scandalized by some of our modern world's present mindset towards them. Number 10. Capture over choice. Consent is my favorite word. It really is, because it's important. But back in ancient times, wasn't really a word anyone really understood. Thousands of years ago, couples skipped right over dating and instead went from captured to married. In fact, it was this idea that kind of sparked the origin of the honeymoon. A bride would be captured from a tribe, the tribe would go looking for her, and the thief would hide her away until they stopped. 
If you have watched the Spartan video on Bumblebee, if you haven't, go check it out. Then you may know that their marriage ceremony centered on this as well, kind of, sort of, but it was, but consent was involved. As a way of courting, the women would wrestle to demonstrate their physical prowess and vice versa. They would watch the men as well and they would kind of simultaneously be like, yep, you. Then the woman's head would be shorn, they would dress them as a boy, and then they would be placed in a dark room and then wait for their betrothed to capture them and take them away. So very confusing there. I don't really understand it. But anyways, let's move on. Number nine, love letters. So nice. Today, it's easy to send a saucy text and an explicit pic to your partner or fling, or a person you're just friends with, but you know. Or the person you've been seeing for like half a year, but they're not your BF or GF, like no. Anyways, the rules are up in the air. But back then, you had to wait with bated breath to receive a thought out letter from your lover, filled with poetry and extravagant flirtations and little drawings. There are love notes between Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. Henry even drew little doodles of a man depicted in lovesick sorrows. Anne then wrote back with drawings showing her talking to the angel Gabriel, being like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get a son. The Tudor version of the emoji. One of their exchanges went, and I quote, If you remember my love and your prayers as strongly as I adore you, I shall scarcely be forgotten, for I am yours, Henry Rex forever. And then Anne's response was, Be daily prove you shall me find, to be to you both loving and kind. And then he cut her head off. How quickly the milk turned sour. But it was the way to play back then, and soon you'd have stacks of letters with declarations of love as you're heading to the chopping block with the guy beside you. Awful way to go. Awful way to go. Henry, you suck. Number eight, escort cards. Today, someone might ask you for you to give them your number so they can text you, you up at like 3 a.m. No, you're not. You're asleep because you have to work the next day. If you lived in the Victorian era, you may have dropped a calling card instead, or an escort card. Want to go on a date? Here's my card. It doesn't sound so romantic, but social calling cards didn't have your usual brick printing and beige background. Social calling cards were lavish, enticing, elegant, with bright colors and lush paper. If a man wanted to court a woman, he would hand her his calling card, which would not only include his name, but compliments to her. Kind of like a Valentine's Day card, but every day of the year. If a woman was the bee's knees and she was unmarried, she'd often return home with stacks of them. If she was particularly fond of one of them, she might take up the offer presented with the card, the offer of escorting a woman to and from a future social gathering. She would send her servant to deliver the news with her own calling card in response. This process was repeated several times and either amounted to something steady or flittered out. We all know what a ghosted text feels like, so I imagine this would be kind of the same. Number seven, knives. Huh? If someone ever hands you a knife outside of lending it to you to eat your lunch, be wary, they may be trying to court you. In some Nordic countries, some courtship rituals involved knives. In Finland, for example, when a girl came of age to start courting, her father would give her an empty sheath to wear. It would be attached to her girdle, and when a suitor liked her, he would put his knife in her sheath. <laughs> <laughs> if the girl was interested, she would keep it. If not, she would give it back. <laughs> Good old nonverbal communication. No. But also imagine putting a knife into the hand of someone you just denied. Ooh. If she kept it, this was also a signal to other suitors that she was taken and not interested in pursuing others. The idea of giving a woman a token of affection that she could use to signal her own interests is seen in many cultures such as... What's next? Number six. Spoons! We talked about knives that fit their sheaths, now let's talk about spoons. Spoons! Dating back all the way to 17th century Wales, suitors would give ornately carved love spoons. They would make it from a single piece of wood to show his affection to his intended. On the spoon, there would be engravings which would symbolize intention, i.e. an anchor, for instance, would mean I desire to settle down, and the vine would mean something like love grows. Rural peasants used wooden spoons to eat and prepare food, so carving spoons to use every day was a usual chore. The most beautiful
beautiful spoons were kept there for to keep as gifts, to give to those you loved or wanted to. The better the spoon, the finer the details, the finer the craftsman, the better the husband, which signaled to the love interest that they were reliable and skilled. The tradition is not specifically unique to Wales, in fact it happened in many Celtic countries. Number 5. Crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all, and this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one just hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign. But a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns in palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? <laughs> well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, On the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. 
Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own, they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians 
Eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's, that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kind of good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds, and cashews put together, ground up, and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool, and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists, or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five, shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four in one shampoos that wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It's just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tofania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tofana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig, then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a on a boat? Whale watching's fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think. I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q 
Q-tips most of us know by now weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Ray's is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Ray's is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesbro Pons bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box, a warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely and Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. 
Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head. A brilliant play. Might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes. And now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it, but you probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey will get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Just some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Tan line, so. Number three, Red Dead Bandage. America, 1864. There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict? It wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason. Idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. Specifically, the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band-aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo-boo better. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays, and let me tell you, Still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the fifth century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg. A little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now, I'm gonna go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. 
We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with it, I'm sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory. I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross, it just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss. So now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It was pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs. Definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food. They couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I want to puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun, a closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet, a home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing, and of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. The more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, the little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a sh Brahman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. This things that be making noise all day long. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good, I like this. I like punching in on this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible, just right there, like the big moon, just it was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair. Then it was immodest. Because, of course. Number seven, loincloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that, I'm like, ha, ah, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages. 
up here at least. But in 2008, Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra, was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support things. Number five. Mummification. Mummification was common. Even today we're finding more mummies. We're uncovering more ancient history. But how the hell was mummification done back then? How was it done so well? We're talking about teeth worms and trepanation. How do ancient Egyptians figure this out? And how is it done in a way where the bodies are still reserved this long? Well, it wasn't cheap, I'll tell you that for free. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's pretty brutal, but what you would do is basically, you get a hook in your nose and all your brains would be pulled out. And then they would cut the left side of your stomach, remove all those goods, all the organs, just bleh, gone, let those dry, yuck. And then you put the heart back in the body and then you wash the insides out with wine and spices over and over again until eventually you cover the body in salt for 70 days and around day 40, you gotta stuff it with sand. Come day 70, that's when you can wrap them in those mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits you and so does the rest of your life. The jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber with the sarcophagus. So it was just a big room of yuck. Number four, cataract surgery. My brother was born with a cataract. This one's for you, homie. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book. Well, rather, in the painting. Found in a tomb in ancient Egypt was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. A little metal rod going into their eye. Just doing this makes me cringe. They believe this was a method called couching. This happened to be recorded. The needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time that it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. So they kind of were the OG couchers. It wasn't until 1747, until a doctor in France named Jacques Daviel, he performed the first cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. Every method, older, ancient, modern, it all sounds wildly uncomfortable. If you've been through this, kudos to you. Hit that like button, glad your eyes and stuff are working. Number three, transplantation. Blood transfusion is one thing, but how the hell do we figure out transplants? This arm, now over there on that guy? Hmm? The first successful one was in 1954 in Boston at the Peter Benton Brigham Hospital. That was like a surgical procedure. The first successful one, by any means, came from around 1000 BC. An Indian surgeon, Samhita, had written down details on how to transplant tissue from one of the body areas to repair nose injuries. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. But later on in the 16th century, that idea was revised. In Renaissance Italy in the 16th century, a man named Gasparo Tagliacozzi, and finally, French surgeon Alexis Carroll changed the medical game again in 1902 they published their work on the new techniques using new studies on animals and blood vessels and to this day that technique is still used. In 1904 they partnered with Charles Guthrie in Chicago and performed the first successful animal transplant saving the dog's life. So not that long ago, really enough, had to include it. Number two, open heart surgery. We've discussed ancient Egyptians and how they would clean out the entire body and put the heart back in. Now of course they weren't alive during any of this, that body is long gone. But when was the first open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality? Well, the first successful open heart surgery went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. Now the surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way, used to be a shoemaker's assistant, saved this man. And the city's first interracial hospital too. Lots of firsts happening in this one. There we go. There weren't any textbooks on this type of operation at the time, so the odds of survival were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all at this point. There were no x-rays, antibiotics, anesthesia, but also there was no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through the nerves, muscles, ribs, everything important, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Cornish survived and come 1894, Williams was promoted to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, DC. Coming at number one, stitches. I'm gonna to totally jinx myself after this, but I've never broken a bone or gotten stitches in my life. I'm on a high alert now at all times. 27, not too bad. Many of my friends though, they've gotten stitches in their life. It's pretty common at this point. So I figured I'd cap this list off by going back to the origins of stitches. 
Going back to 3000 BC, once again, Egyptian literature, stitches were first made from plants, like hemp or cotton, or even animal tendons or animal arteries. Cat gut was the most common. That was thread made of sheep intestines. One of the craziest ways of closing a wound was by using ants, believe it or not. Leaf cutter ants or army ants, they would be held against the opening, and then you wait for it to bite down. And once it does so, you would then remove the body, cut the head off, so the head of the ant is still stuck biting onto your cut, staying there until it heals. Imagine Ant-Man showing up to save the day and he just throws a pocket full of army ants. He's like, I'm here, I'm here to save you all. He just shows up, whips all the ants. He's like, there you go, you're healed. They're like, we didn't expect this at all. Please send somebody else, Ant-Man. Gross. Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys. It's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst, you gotta get up, walk down that long scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes, if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health and so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well-known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters so she put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth and yes, yeah, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian laundry day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when laundry day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case, you know, there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry, hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that 
bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also covered the wigs in powdered scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. And yeah. Number five. The Great Stink, um, the what, what? Oh, no, 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 yeah, I read that right. The Great Stink of 1858 was an event in central London in the summer, during which the hot weather exaggerated and amplified the smell of untreated human waste and gunk that had washed up on both in and on the banks of the River Thames. The problem had been growing for years with an out-of-date technology and overflowing sewage system that emptied directly into the river. The stank was thought to have been the root cause of a number of contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before it was agreed upon that a small problem was emerging. You think? Long story short, all the garbage, human waste, bloated bodies were all just washing up around the same time. Hey, I caught one! No, oh, that's an arm. Okay. And just cooking in all that sun all day? I know what August feels like, and I've smelt my garage and garbage day, and I can't imagine the smell already in central London at that time. And for people to have complained so much that it was even stinkier, that's absolutely rotten. Number four, nose gaze. I was just thinking, where are all these inventions and blueprints on how to stop the smell? If you can knit metal into a crop top, you can cover your mouth and nose, can't you? Well, close enough. Nose gays were invented. Basically just big nose plugs one would wear day to day to drown out the smell of absolute filth. Just plug it up and ignore it was their mentality. A makeshift wad of bunched up herbs and flowers shoved up your nose, blocking the nasal cavity from the stank that followed. Just see number five. A poo-pourri for each nostril. Would this make things worse, ignoring the smell? Wouldn't that make it even harder to find out where it's coming from? Nope, just band-aid it. It's gonna disappear on its own. We're humans, we're designed to smell stuff for our own survival. The smell is like what lets us know not to go down there. Oh, no, no. Like, wouldn't everything just smell like roses at that point? These people were trying to avoid the stinky streets because that actually meant that's where the infection and disease was actually hanging out. The blind leading the blind. Number three, flushing. Okay, we're making some ground here. We got toilet paper, we got something for the smell. So now where do we put it? Well, plumbing and flushing wasn't connected to each house like it is today. See, the Greeks and Romans had it down to a science. They built drainage systems and learned from the ancient Mesopotamian people how to exactly deal with the problem of waste. A system of pipes, tubes, and drains. The bathroom problem seemed like an easy solution. Use gravity downhill to dispose of the waste outside the city. And here's the kicker. It can even be reused and repurposed at the end as an irrigation system, further nurturing the farming of crops. No, that's good. No, he's right. And then it disappears and literally goes downhill again. After the Roman Empire had fallen, this European dark sanitation era had begun and hygiene sort of just slipped away. People weren't really concerned with things like disease and plague and instead leaned into real science like witchcraft or burning cats for fun. You know, important stuff. It wasn't until about the mid 1850s where people revisited this age old problem and recreated and did exactly the same thing science we already knew. Things were unnecessarily stinky for way too long. It wasn't until the British colonies started tinkering in Boston around the 1700s that proper piping and toiletry transport was eventually built and catalogued. Thus was born the first sanitation system again, and we still see it today, thank God. Number two, disinfectants. How did people exactly know if something was clean or not? They couldn't have just seen the particles back then. Let's hear a chamber pot. <sighs> smells clean. People were plugging their noses so they couldn't even smell anything. They couldn't smell if it was clean or not. There certainly wasn't a demand for a fresh lemon scent that we're all used to. This was the birth of some basic antiseptic. 
chemists were mixing and matching chemicals and a new form of cleaning agent was introduced in the 1890s by German chemist science Gustav Rappenstrock in hopes to rid the country of the overflowing cholera epidemic and seize the spread of germs and the disease. By mixing benzalkonium and hydrogen peroxide, you were left with a chemical compound that would destroy and clean infections on medical patients. Light bulb. Thus leaning towards the direction of an all-purpose surface cleaner, killing bacteria and ridding the area of harmful toxins. And drum roll please, Lysol was created. That's right, the same Lysol we use today. This was a push in the right way for humanity. An easy to use liquid cleaner that would aid disinfecting everything in its way. I've seen the bottle and the Wemyss labels. Must have been even stronger back then too. Hope no one spilled it on themselves in testing. Ooh, ouch, that is a class one chemical burn. <laughs> You're just gonna wanna pee on that for 12 to 13 days. And number one, soap. Finally, the end of all our ailments. Soap, the answer. Well, not really. See, it's been around since the Romans because they literally did everything before us and stop bragging, we get it. Made out of animal fats, ash, and mostly lye, these makeshift balls of soap were invented years ago. And then forgotten, and then invented again, and then forgotten again. Cleanliness was loose, remember, and it was almost uncool to believe in science, and it wasn't really until the mass production of this chemical detergent that it really stuck. Soap was predominantly sold produced and commercialized in the late 1800s. By this time, scientists were fiddling around with things like Lysol and more chemical compounds, sparking its way to the study of germs, a vital step towards large-scale soap production. And it actually started in 1791, when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a system for making soda ash from salt, at which point added with animal fat, and there you have it. The slippery bar we're all used to today. The discovery made soap making one of America's fastest growing industries in 1850, and it seemed from then on in it was only up. It's crazy to think that someone at this time, even after soap was invented, were still spit shining surgical instruments to be clean. That's good. Let's prepare for some Western lovin' by first learning the rules of courtship. A cool thing to know is that women had a lot more rights without needing a man in the Western frontier. You could own a business or land or be a bounty hunter or a sharpshooter or just as easily be a brothel keeper or a grocer. Ladies had range. But there was still a ratio of like 90 to 10 men to women on the frontier, so the population had to happen somehow. Courtship required intent to avoid scandal. Young men, no matter how honorable a dandy or lowly a cowboy, must ask a young lady's male guardian for permission to court her. Courting held an inherent promise that said we are spending time together to see if we desire marriage. To be courting doesn't mean you're engaged, but it did signal to all others that the lady was spoken for. Essentially, it was dating. Not this modern version that's been butchered by the last few generations, but rather what we saw in TV classics like Seinfeld, where it was casual and comfortable, no determination on length, just seeing how you two fit together. Courting included meals with the woman's family, taking her her on a sleigh or carriage ride, parlor games, reading aloud, and picnics were very popular, and courting actually made ice cream dates a thing. The Atkinson Daily Patriot printed the following ad on May 16th of 1881. It will also be in order to treat your girl to ice cream as often as once a month. Girls often exchanged things such as a locket, a coin, or even a bullet shell as a gift. If a couple was financially strapped, exchanging locks of hair was a memento as well. Oh, and also coffee. Cowboys sometimes hoarded coffee to impress women. You've learned the rules of courtship, now it's time to claim your lady by sparking and walking out. And no, that's not light a cigarette and leave the room. Sparking and walking out were acts of courting that signified deeper involvement. This is when we started getting to the relationship or engaged parameters. Sparking means to engage in courtship, but it was also a nickname for kissing in PDA, which the American West was considerably less prudish about than the East and South Victorians, seeing no scandal and a little touchy loving. This is particularly due to the scarce supply for women as forementioned. Walking out together is a little more like in the East and the South. Young ladies had a reputation to protect and parents will be parents, regardless of the time. Going on a walk or walking out meant that courting people could be in the public eye and therefore they could ditch a chaperone. Anywhere else this would have been a huge scandal, but on the frontier non-married couples would walk out in public to signify their claim and show mutual respect for it. Now anyone would know if someone was an unloyal partner and bonus, it's before you tie the knot. For a man to take his lady to an event it could involve a lot of work, ride into town, reserve a carriage, retrace the mileage back 
with the rig to collect the lady, then go back once more. That's a lot of time, labor, and dedication, and it's a true testament to the love many couples shared. Walking out remained a popular day even for the married. Gonna get down and dirty, then let's talk to it. Fun slang is up next. You and your lady done did your courting and are getting hitched. Time to impress her with some manly and sexy terminology. Cowboys had a way with words, so it's not too surprising that they used some pretty colorful terms to describe matters of the heart, and that included courting. Getting hitched was a serious business, and spooning or sparking no less. The vernacular was different back then, and lots of phrases and terms used that were common enough that even if they sound gibberish to us, they were full of comprehensive sentences then. A bunch of these are actually still used casually today. From a list of dirty Wild West slang, here's a few recognizable terms. Screwing, fooling around, painted lady, and knocking boots. To get the wrong pig by the tail is dying out a little bit more now, but essentially means picking the wrong person for something. Meanwhile, some more creative and lesser heard slang terms are perooting, which means intercourse. Spooning, unlike now, actually meant intercourse, not cuddling. And a California woman was a term for a separated but not yet divorced woman. Get the mitten was a playful way to tease your homie about getting rejected. For people with dirty mouths, they refused to get their mouths dirty. What do I mean? While some factors of the Wild West were a free for all, one thing agreed upon across the board of the Wild West was that oral pleasure was just a little too exotic. This finding is documented by Chad Heap's novel Slumming Sexual and Racial Encounters in American Nightlife, 1885 to 1940 and states that the euphemism and cowboy slang for the act was the word French. It's not as if it wasn't anywhere else in the world or just had recently become a thing. The act had existed in many regions and goes far back into the BCs. It just seems that people in the Wild West felt it was a little too European for their liking. In fact, oral was so sparse that even the painted ladies were against it, shunning other workers who performed it and refusing to associate or even eat with them. Well, it's time to get freaky deaky, so let's talk contraceptives. Because it wasn't going in here or back there in the Wild West days, so ladies had an issue on their hands if they wanted to avoid a pregnancy but still wanted a literal romp in the hay. Especially since condoms did exist but they were super expensive, so people had to find out prevention methods. Pregnancy and childbirth were incredibly dangerous at the time and with so few women it became a dangerous game to even get pregnant. In fact, many women on the frontier passed during childbirth. Women were often left with the choice of life ending pregnancies or noxious substances to prevent or diminish a pregnancy. These substances were also deadly and contained toxic ingredients, often from plant sources, that would end unwanted or simply prevent egg fertility. The long term side effects for where many women, especially those who worked in brothels and ingested these substances more frequently, would become infertile completely. Ovarian cysts were also a side effect, as well as hemorrhage or organ failure from overexposure to these poisons. It's sad, but in the Wild West, many women had to decide whether to have a baby or the high risk of possibly dying giving birth. Contraceptives, unspoken rules of oral, it seems like it could be hard to learn your birds and bees. Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished. Especially especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh. Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. 
Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial unaliver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old Blight herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband, who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Blight. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? Uh, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, plastic surgery. Some celebrities you think are immortal when really it's just their plastic surgery that's fooling you. Unless you're Paul Rudd, he's definitely immortal. Sometimes it's obvious who's had it done and sometimes it's really obvious who's gotten it done. Coming from the Greek term plastikos, which means to mold or to form, the oldest known plastic surgery took place in ancient Egyptian days. There's a medical text from the ancient Egyptian days that was named after the American Egyptologist who got it in 1862 and in it contains these ancient procedures. They look a little bit different from the shows we see today. You know, where it's like all these medical, we're gonna take this thing and put it into this guy's head. And you're like, how did they do that? This was a lot different. This is ancient procedures we're talking about. What procedure back then was to fix nasal injuries. This method used wooden splints, lint, swabs, and the first ever nose job was done. Even in 2000, a mummy was found with a prosthetic toe. So they asked volunteers to try walking with it to determine if it was created for purpose or for style. That's, that's nice. Here, try on this mummy's toe. Take a lap, see how you feel. Are you cursed? Plastic surgery in the sense of reconstruction, that first account comes from India in the sixth century. The Indian physician Sashruta Shamita is considered the father of plastic surgery. His patients were more interested in the cosmetic side effects, whereas the Egyptian practices were to fix the nose. Now around 500 BC, reconstructive surgery was done in India as well to reform noses that were cut off as a punishment. Number nine, broken bones. Sometimes a bone breaks and it needs immediate medical attention. Maybe a bone is pushing into a vital organ, maybe it's healing the wrong way, or maybe it's just a toe and you can't do anything about it but hobble around the house all day and learn new curse words as you mumble them and hobble. We all had that one friend in school who always had a cast on or that blue finger restraint. There's always the one kid. But what happens if you broke your arm in the 1300s? Then what? Well, you wouldn't get any cool signatures from your cool friends, but what would happen is that they would use these blocks of wood and cloth and just wrap everything around completely tight. Just the biggest cast possible. You actually could sign your name on this thing as many times as you wanted. I take that back. This thing was, you pretty much had a coffin around your leg, more or less. Number eight, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries, trepanation was the worst, that's for sure. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Turning the clocks back thousands of years, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory here is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's just drill holes into our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. 
As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you would think. The reason that this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures. So you'd show up with a headache and then you'd leave with a hole in your head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is pretty surprising. They obviously didn't have advanced medical instruments. They would use any sharp instruments they could find, like rocks, flint. It was pretty rough. This was the first surgical procedure around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, which means a borer, to, you know, to drill, essentially. Number seven, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extractions or whatever, but this for sure counts as surgery. Every time something gets removed from your body and there's blood, I'm gonna count that, sorry. I had to get a tooth pulled a few years ago and I'm still haunted by it. It is so barbaric the way they do it. They don't slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out. No, they had two dentists just grab my tooth at the same time, put their foot up and then just yank my tooth out. Not, like that was, the, the, we're still there, really? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem at all regarding your teeth. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later tooth. Back in 5000 BC, a Sumerian paper referred to dental worms. So the earliest account of tooth decay, we think. Unless they were actual dental worms, in which case gross, but no, it was, you had a cavity. We're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology tell us now if the tooth's coming in sideways, but back then some believed it was always tooth worms, no matter what. If it hurts, yeah, it's worms, get them out. Imagine pulling your tooth out and being like, didn't find any worms. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry in 500 BC, and the way that they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw. So it was pretty horrible. If you go to the dentist now, just when you sit back and relax, you're sitting back and you're relaxing. That's it. The rest sucks, but these guys would stand up and just get the Yang. Number six, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go down. There was lots of bloodshed, of course. There's animals and warriors and a lot of stabby stabbies. And crowds would rush the arena after the day was done, not to get autographs, but to hopefully get a sweet sip of that gladiator blood. Yeah, blood was considered a magical elixir back then. And then near the early 1500s, blood was then seen as youth juice. Yeah, if you drink some young blood as an elderly, those knees would just magically come back. Apparently, don't drink blood if you're watching this. Don't, unless you're Edward Cullen, don't drink blood. Team Jacob. Lots of theories surrounding blood in the Middle Ages. Bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought that your humors were out of balance. It was like, oh, you're sick. You just got some weird blood. We'll, we'll drain you out a bit. Vampires, all vampires. In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey, and that just absolutely changed the game. Now the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture, hypothetically. So we started to test this out on canines, of course. Scientists were injecting them with different substances, and slowly but surely that turned into blood transfusion between canines. So this is back in the 1660s. That's how early we started injecting things. Number five, dating and dangerous. So fun fact, after the Victorian era, or and slash kind of during, going on dates was, uh, Scandalous, like pretty kind of oof. The term date is a relatively new term. It was coined just before the turn of the century. George Ad wrote in the Chicago Record about young women filling up the dates in their calendar with rendezvous with young men, and that was in 1896. In the 1900s, it took a little bit of adjusting. This, therefore, set the term kind of date as women going on dates. In the 1900s, this took a little bit of adjusting. A woman out alone with a man without a chaperone at night and not a courtesan? How scandalous. As more and more women started doing it, people weren't sure how to react. Law enforcement even got involved because they would see a woman alone with a man and be like, she's a woman of the night, and then they'd arrest her or they would be confused. But either way, in the eyes of the law, dating kind of became a crime. Women making a date seemed like they were pulling something else, so sometimes it was illegal to date, though other times it was like, dude, just Stop, we're trying to go get dinner. Leave us alone. Number four, the art of the fan. Ooh. Being entirely open about who you were pursuing could raise a lot of eyebrows and damage one's reputation. So nobles often had to code their advances behind the art of the fan, mostly women, actually all women. If you have ever seen Dangerous Liaisons, you may have noticed Glenn Close 
elegantly using her fan to seduce and manipulate gentlemen callers around her finger. And that really how it was. It was all a game only the cleverest suitors could decode. Carrying it in the right hand in front of your face? Follow me. Placing it on the left ear? I wish to get rid of you. With the handle to the lips? Kiss me. A society lady in the 18th century was expected to know how to elegantly handle and hold a fan. This also helped differentiate between social classes. So not only was it used to set up a secret meeting in the garden with your betrothed lover, it was also used to communicate gossip and information. Number 3. Classified Ads Today we have so many dating apps, it's dizzying. You can swipe left, you can swipe right for your dream beau, any which way you like, Hinge, Tinder, Bumble, is that all there is? Plenty of fish, I don't know. It may surprise you to learn that this wasn't the first time people tried it this way. Enter classified ads. Uh, or personalized ads. If you were desperate for love and knew your person was out there but you just hadn't run into them yet, you would make an ad. In 1722, a Bostonian took space in the New England Current to put out an ad for, and I quote, any young gentlewoman that is minded to dispose of herself in marriage to a well accomplished young widower and has five or six hundred pounds to secure to him by deed of gift, she may repair to the sign of the glass lanthorn in Steeple Square to find find all the encouragement she can reasonably desire." And unquote. It was written by a 16 year old Benjamin Franklin. Oh bless. Some would even put out ads to capture the attention of someone they saw in passing. Take for instance this 1748 printing calling for, and I quote, a lady genteelly dressed. This is to acquaint her that if she is disengaged and inclinable to marry a gentleman who was on that occasion is desirous of making honorable proposals. <laughs> so cute. And now we know that all those dating apps were just a matter of time. Number two, bedding ceremonies. Okay, so I can't, I can't, I can't think of anything I would like least in the world Ugh, than to have an entire room full of guests during one of those private moments in anyone's life especially my parents. Ugh. Now, first comes dating, or courting as it were, then comes marriage slash sometimes they would just skip over dating and just go right to an arranged marriage, especially if you were a noble. And then for a long time comes your aunts, uncles, and parents into the bedding chamber to watch the consummation. Yay! A crowd of people would be there up until the very last second when the curtains were drawn, cheering you on. <laughs> Some would even like offer advice, like don't do that, do this. Some even stayed well past. For instance, on the wedding night of the young King Louis XIII and Anne of Austria, they had two nurses in attendance to make sure the ordeal went down. But this wasn't just in Europe, this also happened in China in the early 1900s. Number one, bundling. Probably one of the most awkward ceremonies ever to take place, As, except for that one. That's the worst. But this is specifically to do with before getting married. As we have gathered thus far, being young and in love, or just being in love in general, has never been too easy. Bundling was a way to make it easier, I guess. I don't know. This 17th century tradition involved having your beau invited over, the parents needed to approve it, of course, and then you were to spend the night sleeping next to each other bundled up to the neck or sometimes just the waist like in like a human sack and then you would sleep next to each other with a plank of wood in the middle. So romantic. The tradition was meant as a way to gauge chemistry between the two lovebirds. The two would get to know each other by talking and sleeping together only before engaging in marriage. If it didn't go well, then they wouldn't get married. If it did go well, so much so that they unwrapped each other like Christmas presents on Christmas morning, then they pretty much got married like as soon as possible. The tradition was pretty popular in Ireland, the rural United Kingdom, and the New England colonies from 16th century into the 18th, but a lot of Victorian ideals were completely against it. They were like, no, corset it up and no love. And coming in at number 10, baths. From bath bombs to jacuzzis, when did people exactly start warming up that cold river water to sit in for some R&R? &R? Well, apparently the Romans were the first to think about warming her up. I don't really know if they had it in mind that warm water works better and faster to clean and rid of microparticles and had more of a oh, mentality, but one way or another they did it. Were they really ahead of their time though? The first bathhouses have been discovered in Rome approximately being built somewhere in the 2nd century BC. 
the first of its kind, from a river of cold water to the abundance of over 500 steaming prominent bathhouses. You could pamper yourself head to toe for a small price, small enough so that even the poorest could bathe. That's a lot of small business owners. Hottest water in town, step right up, step right up. The Romans came up with an idea to build a spa house thing which could be flooded and heated by the floor beneath it. With a giant fireplace inside the spa, it was lit by hand and blown through the vents under the floor. Damn, they were smart, huh? Hot and steamy and good for the body. And clean. Well, cleaner. The bathhouse was a technology of its own and it seemed like humanity was headed in the right direction. No, no they were not. Number nine, wiping. Do as the Romans did. It's thought that these people thought of literally everything before us. Oh yeah? How about pogo sticks, think of that? Huh? Pogoanitis? No, no you didn't. Look that up, did they? Over the years I've had some pretty jobs, but nothing as as this one. Literally. Uh, sire, would you like fronteth to backeth or backeth to fronteth today, sire? That's right, there was a job for that. People had to have had started wiping at some point, right? But who exactly and when? The groom of the stool, chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber. Call it whatever you like, we know what they did. So what exactly did they wipe with? Well, usually hay, sticks, fur, or even seashells. Every single one of those sounds itchy and terrible. I know what Charmin can do sometimes, and I can't imagine what a piece of oak could have done back then. Was there splinter taker routers as well? I can't help but feel, although, how painful and stinky it was. I'm sure there was at least one shared laugh, a little quality time spent with some royalty to say the least. Although this career is speculated, both King Charles I and King James I had them, so unless they decided they wanted to do that after them, someone must have continued doing it. I hope for a pretty penny at least. Those waste management dudes have pretty good benefits. Filing your taxes, looking for a job description. Uh, ah, yes, here it is, wiper. Number eight, urine. Okay, is this just gonna be disgusting the entire time? Well, the answer is yes. History's pretty disgusting. Okay, this one is weird because right when we think we figured it all out, something jarring happens, like a jar of piss and all the health benefits it had throughout history. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, at least they thought it did. In ancient Rome, not only was this liquid gold sold for, well, gold, it was often traded as a prominent good, sold for its multitude of healing purposes. You see, people have been using urine for thousands of years. That's right, this destructive, toxic bodily fluid could be repurposed, salvaged into many different topicals and treatments. From hair loss to your daily skincare routine, it was not only great for staining and softening leather made for shoes and clothes, it was a natural teeth whitener, an antiseptic. <laughs> That's right, from ancient Rome to as late as the 20th century, people have been tinkering and tailoring with their pee. Egyptians did it, Greeks did it. Urine is the body's natural antiseptic and was soon turning septic. Like the science behind this alone is what your buddy tells you, you know what I mean? Oh, rolled ankle? Yeah, yeah, just piss on it. Got ghosts? Ah, just pee on it. The ailment for all your needs. Disgusting. Number seven, teeth. Invented in 1488 by Sir Robert Tooth. Okay, I'm joking, no. Teeth were never officially invented, but what we did for them and how we cared for them had people scratching their heads for the last millennia. We've all had a toothache at some point in our lives, so they must have had them back then. In fact, oral hygiene was utterly disgusting. I didn't brush my teeth after my coffee and I can already feel it. Ew. People's teeth were so bad throughout history that dentists were actually training and teaching each other what to do about the huge toothworm problem. That's right. Imagine worms growing inside your teeth. Well, due to the swelling and pressure, people thought there were actual bugs or evil spirits living within their sore tooth, serving them extreme pain. Nope, just an infection. You need a root canal. Oh, and actual worms and bugs living in the tooth. Uh, yeah, you see this gray area right here? Uh, that's a ladybug, right? It's medieval England and things were pretty medieval. Right down to the surgery and if you had an impacted wisdom tooth, well, that wasn't covered. England, 400 AD. People started this new trend of oral hygiene cleaning but it wasn't spin brushes and floss, no, more like mint and vinegar and prayer. Just kind of swoosh it all around in your mouth and wipe your teeth with your shirt and call it another year. If you were lucky enough to rinse your mouth out at the time, then you could have saved yourself a visit to the medieval dentist chair. Well, actually just a slab of rock you sit up against and have a friend who's good at ripping. And there you go, buddy. Hey, wake up. The infection alone from the dirty tools going into your mouth is making me itchy. I feel like my breath stinks more now after I've read this topic. Anybody have any gum? Number six. 
toilet paper. Finally, something we recognize. Invented originally in China in 851 from the Tang Dynasty, these soft fabric sheets were designed for, well, you know what it was designed for, but yes, mostly the emperor's bathroom breaks and soon caught on for the commonwealth as well. The higher the class, the softer and more luxurious the material. From leather to silk, butts were seeing a kinder, gentler side of hygiene. Two ply bark versus four ply silk. The use of toilet paper throughout Europe is a messy one. Again, wipers and hay and stuff like that. It wasn't until the toilet paper rule created by Joseph Gaiety in 1857 that this hygiene method would solidify and stay for keeps. The classic under versus over is the tale as old as time. You ever want to get into a quick argument at someone's house? Just peek in the loo, see if they're rocking beard or mullet. It's the simplest way to have a know-it-all show you the patent and tell you how to wipe your own ass. Charmin. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a, that's more of a at-home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain, why did I do this to myself, contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That Allison really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots, with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible. That's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, mm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad, I can't lie. It does, and it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. 
<laughs> Neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap for starters. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body. And then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that stuff, turpentine, turpentines, all the time and teens, just all in there washing it out. Then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days. That's a long time. But around day 40, you would stuff it with sand. Now come day 70, finally, that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits forever, really. And then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber. Now it's, we don't do it, it's not as fun anymore. We don't put our organs in jars. We don't stuff anyone with sand. We should, you know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it. I think it's time. Yeah.